Thank you for joining our fair housing webinar session on general questions. My name is Paul Turner and I'll be your host for today's webinar. We are joined by our experts from Enterprise Community Partners and APT Associates who will be presenting and taking your questions. We're glad you joined us today. We will start by reviewing some logistical items and move on to the open question period where you can type in questions for our experts. We will answer as many questions as we have time to address today. First, a bit about our platform. We are using Zoom today to facilitate our event. We are recording this session and we will make a recording available to all registrants in a few weeks. We will also share an email survey in the coming weeks to get your feedback on how to improve these sessions. We encourage you to complete that survey when you receive it. If you have not used Zoom before, you will see that the lower center portion of the screen contains the controls. Chat has been disabled and all participants audio has been muted. In order to ask your question, please click the Q&A button in the Zoom menu as shown on the screen. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation. I'll now pass it to our presenters, Jared Elwell, Senior Director with Enterprise Community Partners, Andrea Jurisek, Director with Enterprise Community Partners, and Lauren Walker-Lee, Senior Associate with App Associates. Thank you all so much for joining today. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to General Questions for Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Office Hours. Um, I will, uh, my name is Jared Ewell and I'm a senior director with Enterprise Community Partners and I will hand it off to my colleague, Andrea Jurasek to introduce herself and then we'll pass it along to Lauren Walker-Lee. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrea Jurasek, a uh, brand new director with Enterprise Community Partners. Lauren? Thanks, Andrea and Jared. And I'm Lauren Walker-Lee, a senior associate with APT Associates and good afternoon to all of you. I'm going to give um, an overview of um, why we're here for this general session and just some context for the session, and then we'll take your questions at the end. Um, to start off with, uh, we are not employees of HUD, and the views we share are based on our experience as fair housing practitioners and technical assistance providers. Most of the folks that have joined previous calls are grantees of the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. As HUD grantees, you must regularly certify compliance with the Fair Housing Act's Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Requirements, or AFFH. The Fair Housing Act prohibits, among other things, discrimination in the sale, rental, and financing of dwellings and in other housing-related transactions because of race, color, religion, sex, familial status, national origin, or disability. It also extends beyond this non-discrimination mandate, requiring HUD to administer its programs and activities relating to housing and urban development in a manner that affirmatively furthers the purposes of the act. Courts have found that this requires HUD grantees to go beyond simply avoiding and barring discriminatory practices. HUD grantees must take meaningful steps to affirmatively further the Fair Housing Act's objectives such as acting to desegregate communities. In the years prior to 2015, HUD implemented the AFFH mandate by requiring each grantee to complete an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice that we often refer to as AIs. It did not have a process in place to system systematically verify compliance. The 2015 AFFH rule established a process by which grantees had to conduct a more extensive analysis of local fair housing concerns called an assessment of fair housing or an AFH, commit to specific steps to remedy them, and then submit their AFH to HUD for review. It also created a regulatory definition of the AFFH requirement to clarify the substantive expectations HUD had for grantees. In the summer of 2020, the prior administration replaced the 2015 AFFH rule with one called preserving neighborhood and community choice without going through the required notice and comment process. That rule not only rescinded the 2015 AFFH rule, but also redefined the term fair housing, as well as the Fair Housing Act's AFFH obligation to eliminate much of HUD grant grantees' responsibility to address fair housing issues. On June 10th, 2021, 
HUD published in the Federal Register an interim final rule or IFR entitled Restoring Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Definitions and Certifications to Restore Meaningful Implementation of the Fair Housing Act's AFFH Requirement. The IFR rescinds the 2020 rule, but does not restore the 2015 AFFH rules procedural provisions that governed how HUD grantees conduct fair housing planning and how HUD would provide review. The IFR does not require any particular fair housing planning process, so long as grantees can meaningfully certify that they are meeting the Fair Housing Act's AFFH obligation. After the IFR becomes effective, HUD will provide technical assistance and support for grantees that want help with fair housing planning to support their certification. Consistent with the statutory obligation under the Fair Housing Act, the IFR requires HUD grantees to certify that they will affirmatively further fair housing, which is defined as taking meaningful actions to address significant disparities in housing needs and in access to opportunity, replacing segregated living patterns with those that are truly integrated and balanced and transforming racially or ethnically concentrated areas of poverty into areas of opportunity and fostering and maintaining compliance with civil rights and fair housing laws. The IFR does not require HUD grantees to participate in a fair housing planning process, however, HUD anticipates that many grantees may want to engage in an established form of fair housing planning, and HUD will provide assistance to help its grantees undertake these efforts. While not required to do so, grantees may choose to continue to engage in familiar fair housing planning processes, such as implementing an AI or AFH, updating an existing AI or AFH, or conducting a new one. Grantees may also choose to engage in other means of fair housing planning that meaningfully support their certification. The question on many of your minds is when will HUD issue a new rule? What we've heard is that the new proposed fair housing planning rule is currently at the Office of Management and Budget. And once reported out, there will be the required period for public comment of up to 60 days. So that is the review. And now Andrea, Jared, and I are here to answer your general questions. Thank you. Thanks, Lauren, for the intro and the opening. Um, and now is an opportunity for folks to, to ask questions about affirmatively furthering fair housing uh, and, and even more generally fair housing. Um, welcome any questions, all questions. And if we don't receive any questions in the near term, we have some standard questions that folks have asked in the past that we will review for you. Okay, we have a question from Alicia. What are some data resources that folks are using to look at impediments or fair housing for fair housing? That's an excellent question. Um, and, and, and just as a um, reminder, the next session, which is on September 27th, will be specifically on data. So there will be a lot more detailed information during that session. Um, there, um, there are the, there's the HUD, we can put it into the, um, the chat section. There is what is currently on the HUD Exchange website to be able to look at that data source. Um, there are a variety of other data sources that um, jurisdictions have used. Um, and a very good place to go for, for the looking at the just different kinds of data is the MIT 
AFFH website to see what kind of data is in those particular uh, fair housing plans. Jared or Andrea, do you have any, any suggestions for specific data sources that you've liked? I agree with you, Lauren. The, the HUD's AFFHT uh, EGIS site, it provides maps and also data tables um, that cover many of the fair housing issues that folks encounter, including segregation, racially and ethnically concentrated areas of poverty, publicly supported housing, uh, it maps out all of the publicly supported housing by funding source uh, is, a, is a valuable resource. The, the only limitation with it right now is that the most recent data uploaded is from the 2019 ACS. It has not been updated to include the 2020 census. Um, but then there's, there are so many local data sources uh, available to folks that they can use for fair housing planning purposes. Um, including information from your permitting offices within your city, your local fair housing complaints um, that may be filed with your city if, if you have an office of civil rights or human rights. And we also encourage folks to reach out to their local HUD field office to receive complaint data for the last you know, roughly five years or so um, to understand what types of complaints are being filed in your in your jurisdiction or your region. And in addition to just even the local HUD office is if you have a fair housing assistance program in your area or a fair housing initiative program funded area, nonprofit fair housing agency, those are really good sources for any specific detail um, on those complaints, on any testing that has been done, um, audit testing that has been done, um, just helpful to get as much information about what's happening in your jurisdiction. And the only thing I would add to that is if you are doing any sort of collaboration with your local school districts, um, community partners to reach out to them as well for their data and information. Yeah, and PHAs as well. Um, and if you have a transit authority, they have Title VI requirements um, that they um, oftentimes have their own mapping of looking at routes and different things. So um, just really thinking about where there's impacts throughout your community and contacting those government or private sources for that information. Great. Um, so another question came in, uh, how often are we supposed to certify that we are furthering fair housing? Good question. So when you receive your grant agreement from HUD, basically on an annual basis, uh, one of the attachments is a certification that you, your jurisdiction signs uh, affirming that you are affirmatively furthering fair housing in your jurisdiction. It is a precondition of receipt of your funding. So on an annual basis. Great, thanks Jared. Um, so a question came in from Victoria. Um, so, uh, so what exactly would be changing to HUD's fair housing definition slash approach? I'm sure, Victoria, that what you're referring to is, is what's coming out. What's changed since in the current, what we're under now is voluntary options for fair housing planning of either doing an analysis of impediments to fair housing choice or an assessment of fair housing or updating one that you have, um, or a hybrid model of something that is um, that looks at those kinds of elements and perhaps some other information. And we don't know what's gonna be coming up um, in the next rule until we all get to look at it at the same time. Okay. Thank you, Lauren. Um, so another question came in, some of my grantees AI is 10 years old. Is there a certain age on these? So we would strongly recommend, well, if we, if we go backwards, the, the AFFH rule from 2015 basically mandated 
that the updates to your fair housing plan, which then was your assessment of fair housing, coincided or preceded the submission of your, your consolidated plan. So whether it was a three-year, four-year, five-year consolidated plan, you were expected to submit your AFH and have it approved prior to submission of that con plan. So um, a good practice is, is no less than, well, how about updating your fair housing plan every three to five years is a best practice. Thank you, Jared. Um, another question. Do you have any examples of how cities, counties have brought in policy uh, slash code regarding housing type, uh, tiny homes, modular homes, et cetera, to further fair access to housing? Uh, I am going to drop into the chat a new link to an Urban Institute report on this very issue uh, as a good resource. I can think of a lot of cities um, and counties around the country that are looking at just that um, and have carefully considered tiny homes. Um, and modular homes with the kind of situations that they're dealing with with homelessness. Um, but I look forward to reading whatever Jared has put in the chat as well. Okay. So another question. Um, let's see, is is there a does anyone have a sen any sense that the AFFH reporting requirements will be more comprehensive slash far reaching? Or will this just be a tweak to the existing processes? I realize this will be in an educated guess. I don't know. <laughs> I do, I mean, we do know that HUD spent time, uh, both this administration and the previous administration spent time doing town halls getting feedback from jurisdictions around the country about the experience of developing and submitting assessments of fair housing. Um, I have to believe that there's going to be revisions and that the feedback was received by HUD regarding the arduousness of preparing an assessment of fair housing. But what exactly that'll look like, we don't know. I can't imagine it's going to be more far reaching than the assessment of fair housing was. Hey, we have a question that came in from Susan. Um, during the AFFH, HUD provided maps of data. Are they still valid to use? I know there were some issues with the data in the past. Yeah. So, I mentioned, so they are still available. Uh, the link is in the chat. Michelle sent that out to folks. Um, I did provide the limitation that the data is only through the 2019 ACS and does not yet include the 2020 census data. Um, I think the data, there were some glitches in version two of the data that were uploaded to the system uh, and we're currently, I believe, on version six. And I haven't heard of any systemic issues with the data since version two, uh, which was probably in 2016. Yeah, it would have been towards the end of 2016 that we encountered some of those data issues. Um, but I haven't heard of anything. And once again, um, the session later this month, uh, the final Tuesday of the month, we'll be uh, talking about data and also demonstrating that tool's use. Yeah, we, got a, we have a question from Jason. Um, what is what is the biggest obstacle, what are the biggest obstacles for audits slash inspections to make sure PJs are complying with fair housing requirements? 
outside of COVID, of course, uh, because we have not been able to do on-site audits or inspections. This is a tough question to respond to. Um, so I, yeah, because we are under the interim final rule and folks are not required to engage in fair housing planning, historically under the AI during an audit or inspection, a HUD FHEO rep would show up or a CPD rep and say, do you have an AI? And you would physically point to it or show it to them. And generally that satisfied the requirement. Under the AFH that had to be reviewed and approved. Um, and that was a, a, a pretty intensive process. So now under the interim final rule where there is no requirement to do fair housing planning, I'm not sure what you would be auditing or inspecting, um, but I think a, a pretty safe standard is to revert back to the analysis of impediments, which had the three components. Identify your impediments to fair housing, um, articulate what you're going to do to overcome those impediments. And the third part of that was document your efforts. So if you're certifying that you're affirmatively furthering fair housing and you're doing those three things and you're able to demonstrate your efforts to overcome your challenges to fair housing, uh, I think under the current circumstances, that would suffice. Anything to add, Lauren or Andrea? And the, and the only thing that I would add um, that doesn't relate to audits and, and inspections, yes, we are still in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that has impacted a lot of things. Um, hopefully there are some elements of fair housing planning that you've been able to um, take a look at and to analyze during this time period as it relates to putting some kind of plan in place as you're certifying your compliance. Okay, we have another question. Um, does the AFFH rule relate at all to required, um, excuse me, does the AFFH rule relate at all to required affirmative fair housing marketing plans? Um, I would punt this one first to Andrea. So the, yeah, the affirmative uh, marketing plan is a separate requirement for development um, and also may be affected by your state law, um, your uh, various funding mechanisms at the state level. So it is um, similar wording. Um, obviously, if you're doing a strong affirmative marketing plan, it's uh, helps the jurisdiction. If there is any local or state funding, um, affirm their uh, commitment to fair furthering fair housing. Um, but it is a, a different requirement at the developer level. Okay. Thank you, Andrea, um, we have a question from Drew. Um, what special requirements are necessary for websites that market housing? The kind of, um, when I was doing analysis of impediments and doing assessment of fair housing and would, would be looking at different kinds of websites, I would be looking to see that the HUD logo was there and that there was fair housing information that was um, current and accurate, um, that it would cover not only the federal protected class bases, but whatever the state and local uh, bases were. And if there were any differences in enforcement provisions with those and whether there was good, good fair housing information that was on the website. Uh, Jared, Andrea, do you have anything else that you look for in websites? Uh, nothing to add. 
I, I would just make sure that they're compliance with accessibility standards. Mm -hmm. um, and if possible, um, depending on your population, um, you know, who you're trying to reach, especially making sure that they are available or that the, uh, they, they are translatable into different languages based on your, um, your region's demographics. Um, so for instance, I'm in Chicago, uh, about a third of our city speaks Spanish. So we would wanna make sure that information is available in Spanish as well. Great. Um, so we have another question from Natalie. Um, our nonprofit is a HUD COC grantee. What level of AFFH planning and documentation is required for us to develop? So with regard to COC, uh, basically you're a subrecipient of the COC. Our nonprofit is a HUD COC grantee. So yeah, it's not clear to me if, if you are a subrecipient or the actual grantee, the, the COC lead. Um, but either way, you should be plugged in as a stakeholder into your local jurisdiction's fair housing planning process, whatever that looks like. Um, there are all sorts of fair housing requirements that as a COC grantee, you are responsible for complying with, uh, especially related to your, your policies and procedures, uh, and even more specifically around reasonable accommodations and modifications and clearly uh, non-discrimination. So, but I would encourage you if you've never been engaged to reach out to the local jurisdiction to plug into the, lo the, the local or regional fair housing planning process. Thank you. Um, so we have another question from Tiffany. Um, and she stated, I might have missed it, but when do you expect more changes to come to what is required to show AFFH? So what we know is that the new planning process is at the Office of Management and Budget. And once it's reported out, there will be a up to 60 day comment period. So we are all waiting for to see that um, at the same time. And we'll get a glimpse of what that's going to look at before they make any changes to that rule. Thank you, Lauren. Um, we have a question in from Milton um, and he requested, can you please repeat the three steps? Um, he was in the middle of taking notes and missed something. Um, and the two that he, the one that he dig out, did receive was identify impediments. Describe what you were doing. Yep, and the third piece is document your efforts. And that's with the analysis of impediments to fair housing choice. Oh, follow up to timeline question. Um, so as Lauren mentioned, the proposed fair housing planning rule is with the Office of Management and Budget. It was sent over at the end of June and they have 90 days to review. So we're expecting 
that rule with comments to be sent back to HUD sometime by the end of September. HUD will need to address whatever feedback they receive from OMB. So we have no idea how long that will take. And then as Lauren mentioned, there'll be a 60 day, a no less than 60 day public comment period um, with at which time HUD will have to respond and address all of the comments that come in after that 60 days expires. So we're, we're, we're basically um, at a, we're guessing on how long it will take for a rule uh, to go into effect, but we don't anticipate it going into effect before the mid part of 2023, just based on the timelines. And, and just like the 2015 rule, there was, a, there was a staggered implementation based on folks' con plans. Um, so we don't expect that the rule is gonna go into effect in the summer of 2023 and jurisdictions are gonna be expected to submit a fair housing plan in the fall of 2023. That's just not realistic. The way it worked with, with the 2015 rule is the rule went into effect at the in the summer of 2015 and the first AFHs were due in September of 2016. If I can um, just offer some information on one of a previously previously answered question, quest, asked question, um, while we're waiting for some other questions to come in, um, a lot of folks have asked where they can find information on uh, different assessment of fair housing that have been completed and any action plans. The MIT AFFH website has a lot of jurisdictions that have completed plans that are there. And there's a full page that's devoted to those entities action plans as well. It's a, just a really good place to go to look at how people are doing their planning process, how they're incorporating um, individuals in their communities and um, what kind of data that they're using and to look at those different kinds of actions and for that, for that meaningful um, engagement of um, a, affirmatively furthering fair housing. Lauren, did you say that was the MIT website? 
Yes. Do you have that or would you like me to put that in? I do not have a link for that. I will put that in. Thank you. Okay, we have another question. Um, I'm a property manager for a PRAC 202. Once a year, we are given a fair housing training by our employer. Is there a minimum amount of hours that is suggested as a best practice? I don't know if there's a minimum amount of hours, um, more a minimum amount of content or coverage of what would be uh, discussed in the trainings, making sure, of course, that it's relevant to the type of housing that you have, the um, understanding things like reasonable accommodations and modifications um, and your, your requirements there. Um, and then of course, any staff changeover that happens um, at the, the property, ensuring that they're receiving um, you know, a base level of training as well. Lauren, in your role running a, a fair housing initiatives program, what was the type of training that you offered to property management firms? If you all did that, do you remember? Uh, we did do, we did a lot of that. Um, and this is a situation where you can contact your um, nonprofit fair housing agency um, to contract for training. And sometimes that there's free training that takes place and even fair housing conferences. Um, it may be based upon state or local guidelines, but I know that in my state, there were a required number of hours that people in the real estate business needed to have, um, it's just in terms of fair housing credits, kind of like lawyers with CLE credits. And so what we would do at my nonprofit agencies is that we would uh, make sure that we could get that credit for those people in the realty business. I think um, Andrea is right, um, making sure that your fair housing training is thorough and it covers all the different areas so that you have confidence that the people that you employ really understand fair housing and re reasonable accommodation and know that it's all of your employees, um, not just the people who you think are connecting with potential renters or homeowners or um, uh, or just people, people that are um, connected with your business. So connecting in with um, finding out when HUD has training, finding out when the Fair Housing Assistance Program or the nonprofit um, agency has training. There's also the, on the HUD exchange, there's the National Fair Housing Training Academy, NAFTA which has a lot of regular trainings, um, podcasts, other information. There's a lot of information out there. Certainly with our time in a pandemic, we don't have as many conferences, but there have been some of those that have been online. So making sure that you are um, providing those opportunities for your staff, um, paying for trainings, and um, whether you're having someone come in to do those trainings for you, or whether you're allowing your staff to go out and take those trainings in the community. I think you raised good points, both Andrea and Lauren, about the type of training. So it's important when folks are coming on as new staff that they receive the overview of fair housing, um, and that that is revisited on an annual basis, but I think it's even more important that it's targeted to 
uh, the specific type of housing that 202 provides. So the, the reasonable accommodations piece, modifications, and, uh, and non-discrimination and also accessibility. Uh, it makes a lot of sense for the training to be focused on those issues. And I'm going to put in the chat the link for the HUD Exchange National Fair Housing Training Academy and also the National Fair Housing Alliance, which has a list of nonprofit fair housing agencies across the country that um, may be able to help with any fair housing training that takes place. I'm also putting a list of the fair housing assistance programs, which many states and cities also have. There is a lot of silence uh, during office hours. During office hours, we we are waiting for folks to answer questions. That is why we're here. If it if it does have a, sort of an empty lecture hall sort of feel to it, that would be why. Mm -hmm. Anything else you can think of, Lauren or Andrea, Paul, Michelle, that has come up in previous sessions that we haven't addressed yet? I'm taking a look at some of our previous questions. Um, we've shared some information from some of those, and I'll see if there's something that we can throw out there. Yeah, I think you, you mentioned in the opening, Lauren, about hybrid approaches. Mm. Um, we, have, we have received some questions in the past about you know, jurisdictions that are engaged in hybrid approaches. Um, New York City, Boston, Washington, DC, city of Chicago uh, have all employed a hybrid approach between the analysis of impediments to fair housing and the assessment of fair housing. So they've taken elements of both uh, and used that to sort of create their own fair housing plan and planning process, um, all of which have in, involved significant amounts of community engagement. Um, we received another question. Um, where would you be able to access the comment section when the final rule is up for the up for public comment? Will that be online? 
I, um, I assume that that will be online because in previous situations with any new HUD regulations, those are posted online. And the, in terms of the process of how to engage is also there. And seeing the next question that Andrew asked about putting the information in, I put three links. Yeah, I think they just were to the host and panel. I sent them to oh, good. everyone. Thank so, you. Yeah. If Thank there's you, any Linda. other links that people are missing, please let us know. Okay. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. There, yeah, there's one more link. Um, so we have another question. Um, my agency has revisited its current AIs and reviewed the relevance of the previous 2021 responses. We have not yet officially tweaked the AI for concerns that it will mean full-blown revision of the AFFH. We are sort of on hold until the new guidance comes out. Are we doing enough? A lot was on hold during the height of COVID. So we can't answer the question about whether you're doing enough because we don't know what you're doing. Um, and and the, the, the comment or question isn't exactly clear to me, maybe Lauren or, or Andrea, you're seeing something that I'm not, but it seems like there's a conflation between what looks to be like the assessment of fair housing and an analysis of impediments here. So I'm not sure if you all have an assessment of fair housing, um, but I will say as a best practice, the guidance that came out and accompanied the assessment of fair housing was when you had a significant influx of funding, particularly federal funding, or if there was a disaster, that you would do an amendment to your assessment of fair housing to reflect uh, how you were planning to use those dollars, not only to address the crisis or concerns, but also to affirmatively further fair housing. Um, and I know that you know folks were folks were completely strapped during COVID, staff-wise, trying to stand up programs and deploy uh, unforeseen and amounts of capital. So we understand those challenges, but. Um, yeah, it's tough for us to answer. Anything to add to that, Lauren or Andrea? Go ahead, Lauren. You want to go first? Well, I was just going to say that um, you know, knowing that the what we've seen of the interim rule not requiring um, a formal process for assessing your fair housing um, issues in your jurisdiction, I would say that you know the sooner that you can really get um, start looking at um, the data in your area and making that update, uh, depending on how old your AI is, um, probably the better. Um, that way, you know, you're already in compliance with the new rule once it drops, hopefully. And um, you can also start uh, planning for a new, a new year, um, given that it's already September, so. And the only thing that I would add to it is, um, is your, whether you've, there are meaningful actions and how you've done a really deep dive and you're really proud of your comprehensive work, um, whether you are ready to just submit it or to say it's done or whether you think that it would benefit from uh, taking a look at the new role to be able to add some additional information that you hadn't thought about. So it's, it, it goes back to Jared's first answer is we can't answer that because we don't know what you've done. But if you feel like you've done an excellent comprehensive job with your analysis of impediments and that you have an excellent plan in place, um, it may be just taking a look at that new rule and saying, we're done for now, we're gonna submit it. Or that you really want feel like you have an opportunity to go back and do something more meaningful.
Thank you. We received another question. Um, in a consortium, do all the grantees need to participate in a new AF AFH or can they have an AI and not join? So the simple answer right now is that nobody is required to have either an AI or an AFH mm -hmm. under the interim final rule. Um, and it's also, it would be helpful to understand if this was a CD, CDBG consortia or a home consortia and whether or not the jurisdiction is an entitlement jurisdiction by itself or not. Um, and that would be more for the moving forward than under the current state of the interim final rule. Um, but the simple answer to the question is they don't technically need to have either right now. Um, but it sounds like y'all are going to have some work to do when the new rule gets released and figuring out how to move forward as a consortia. And AI is an, an analysis of impediments to fair housing and an AFH is an assessment of fair housing. The AFH was created under the 2015 Affirmatively Furthering Fair Housing Rule and the AI is normally uh, connected to requirements under um, CDBG, home funding, things like that. I think we've put that information, I think we put HUD's link on AFFH in the chat section um, early on. Is that correct, Michelle? Or should we put that in again? It has the different, the AIs and the AFHs, an explanation of what those are and where the resources are, the planning guides for helping to do those different things. Thank you for posting that, Michelle. Tiffany uh, would like to know, um, she stated that she missed the earlier sessions. Will they be available for viewing on, this, on the session links? And we do have a, on our last slide of this presentation, we talk about where these recordings can be located. But I guess the answer to that is yes, you will be able to have access to the earlier sessions and those recordings. And as we are in our last five minutes, we could put that last slide up that has the next sessions and the information on the website if this is a good time to do that. So the, um, the upcoming ses sessions, as we've talked about, is September 27th is the data collection and analysis. Um, Andrea and I will be joining you and we will have Stephen Whitlow from Apt Associates who will be helping us walk through HUD's uh, mapping tool and data tool. Uh, we have the first session of every month is um, on general questions like this one. So the special sessions are October 25th, which will be on goal setting and reporting and November 22nd on community engagement. And as you can see um, from the, the bottom is you can register for these sessions on the HUD exchange and you can find the information there with any past sessions. And before Tiffany, we send Tiffany on a goose chase. I don't think that the previous sessions have been uploaded to the HUD exchange yet. Um, we are finalizing the 508 compliance with the recordings and the transcripts. 
Um, and once that's complete, they will all be uploaded to the HUD exchange. Any other last minute questions? Well, thank you all for joining us for office hours general session and we'll see you again in a couple of weeks. Hey, this concludes today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining. Have a great day.